This recording is on a lecture that I had given last semester at Brooklyn College for an undergraduate course on large-scale software application development. I was invited to speak about my experiences in working with the web, of giving some tips to undergraduate students on some advice for working with web technology in general and creating websites. And so this is what I've put together as a way to show the context of all the various um, challenges that one can face and some of the tips, uh, tools and tips that are available. I'd like to talk about the web, developing for the web, and basically what I call the web development world. I wanted to talk a little bit about my ideas for how I came about this talk, how I've designed it, um, and my inspirations. So if you see this character on the screen, we know this character as a plumber who goes from one end of a piping system to the other. And that's actually very similar to the role of programmers. They think about how to move data from one end of a system to the other without losing any of it to transform data properly as it moves and propagates through the system. Instead of just focusing solely on that, I wanted to bring attention to this world that we're currently living in and the employment prospects that tech folks have. So I wanted to bring this idea of working in a restaurant, working in the food service industry, because I think it's a really great example of talking about how we're moving into the space of creating apps and other products and services for the end user. So this character that's shown on the screen, even though he's known as a plumber, I believe there's a recent video game where he has certain challenges where he's got to cook. And um, that actually is very similar to a lot of the web development type of concepts out there. Now, before I begin diving into this presentation, I want to talk about communication and talk about how misleading one can end up being by, by coincidence, not by intention. To illustrate uh, the, the difference is that the sky is blue when it's sunny, when conditions are perfect. But sometimes we'll have conditions where there's cloudy sky covering the sun, maybe there's smog, maybe it's sunset or it's nighttime. So the sky is not technically blue, but we still recognize the sky as being blue. So we have Mario. He's a character who is a plumber. He travels through a tunnel system in a well-known video game. And along the way, he'll meet challenges and villains and try to overcome all of that. And I would say that's very much like the whole world out there in working with any sort of system, and, but, but more specifically, the challenges that can be faced when you're developing for the web. The first of these challenges I want to talk about is working on a team setting. For the most part, web projects take a large amount of people and a lot of different personalities to work together towards the same goal. Here's an image of a sign that you might find on the subway. It shows what are quote unquote acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And it serves as a really good reference point for new writers on the subway to know what they should or should not do. It also helps remind writers who do frequent the subway not to do certain things. And basically it serves as a common policy so that everyone can have a very safe and comfortable writing experience. And so what I'm trying to convey here is this idea of there's communication, communication as a general thing, but communication also as a more specific technical thing. And now the idea of communication as a way for multiple people, groups of people, I should say, to be able to work together smoothly. 
A really large communication network that we know of is basically the internet. It was created a while back, um, I want to say in the 70s, <clears throat> around then, uh, for researchers to be able to send files to one another, to be able to send messages, electronic mail as they called it, and just be able to communicate with each other even if they were in different cities, across different time zones, across a very large geographic distance. By the time that the, this uh, internet became mainstream, the media would call it the information superhighway. They'd talk about the potential for being able to, to, to be able to send information to a lot of different people and very quickly at the speed of light. So this idea of communication is very important when we're talking about the web, when we're talking about working and creating products for the web. Now here's a YouTube video that I've linked here that you can watch on your own time that talks about the way people talked about the internet uh, back when they used the CRT monitors and they had a lot to share about the possibilities. Here's another video from a few decades ago. So this idea of communication has been pre quite prevalent uh, back in the day. If I go back one slide, you can see all these signs that show traffic signals as a way to uh, communicate to each other. It, it is a form of communication. And here are like more personal services. I think they were also talking about online shopping and other conveniences, so you know, Take a look, uh, you'll learn a lot more about what was happening back then. Um, and just to recap, this idea of the information superhighway is that the whole world is connected to each other. It is basically referring to the whole internet as just a huge network. The web is just another word for the internet. So we're really talking about a bunch of connected machines. Right? And if we were to look at specific architectural diagrams of what that might look like, for instance, we have a cloud showing the internet, but then you know, perhaps if we are talking about Brooklyn College's network, we might have a uh, internet provider, and then the IT, ITS department might be handling the routing of different ports and IP addresses. And then eventually it'll like link to the different buildings and cables going to each of the offices and classrooms so that each machine that's linked up can have its own IP address. And this is just the whole network. There might be network servers. So for instance, if you're at one computer lab and you're trying to connect to the servers for, from another lab, you can do that. That is the beauty of networked machines. And then on this other side shown is this concept of you can have machines, uh, modems and routers, one or the other or both connected. And then you can have a wireless network and you can have different machines connected to that. So the role of plumbers, quote unquote plumbers, because programmers and other tech folks work at making sure that data passes through correctly from one machine to the next. And because of that, there's a lot of technology that developed over the last few decades that allow this to be possible. It wasn't easy, but it definitely took a lot of iterative brainstorming and trial and error. And then, you know, decade after decade, lots of improvement was made. So basically, the web is just a bunch of network machines, 
You could take a networking class to learn more about the networking aspects, how a network uh, could be set up, how to configure it properly, and all that other fun stuff. One of the things that you will most likely learn if you were to take a networking class is this idea of different layers of the network. You have the at the bottom, the network itself, passing packets from one machine to the next. And you'll hear of keywords jargon like pings or packets or buffering maybe. All of this is just like the exact little bits of data that's being passed. Now at the other end of the spectrum, you have more of the stuff that the user might see. All right, so I'm gonna simplify that and say that web development is generally the application layer. It focuses on the sessions that users might have. It focuses on the user interface, it focuses a lot more on the data that the user is gonna end up seeing. It's not to say that you don't have any of the other stuff, but for the most part, web development is generally the application layer. Now, if you're into DevOps and other stuff, maybe you'll touch upon this bottom, uh, more hardware type roles, uh, or sorry, more hardware type of uh, activities. And what I've shown here is two different models. In case you're wondering, I'm just showing two different network models. It, there might be more out there. For now, like I just wanna show some of the more common models out there. And no matter which one you look at, you'll definitely see there is the more hardware type layers, and then there's a more user, end user facing application type of uh, layers. So you could have the more simplified TCP IP model with the four layers, or you can have the OSI model uh, with, with more layers. So the rest of this talk is gonna be focused more on this web development layer uh, or, and or, or you might call the application layer. Of the technologies available to build the application layer, we've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I wanted to remind you about the importance of communication and the importance of developing a professional opinion because here I wanna show you a couple of different tweets by different professionals who each have their own take on how they fit the various pieces together. I'm not trying to show this as like the one and only way to interpret the connection of all these various tools. I wanted to showcase that each person may have a slightly different view of how an, um, how a particular piece fits in with everything else. But one thing that I do wanna share that is in common with both is that in order to create websites and be able to deliver apps on the web, you do need HTML to structure things. You do need CSS to help manage all the styling aspects. And then you do need JavaScript to be able to handle some of the more dynamic behavior. Even if you learn about other languages that translate into HTML, it helps to know a little bit of HTML to get by. It helps to know cascading style sheets, CSS, because that is where you can De declare a bunch of style rules and go, you know, into a very like sophisticated world of, of design there. And then you have JavaScript, which can help a lot with the dynamic behavior of websites. So I've copied a screenshot of somebody's tweet. It is just one person's opinion. There might be a lot of people who agree with this person. And if you follow the link to his tweet, you can uh, take a look, see who agrees, who doesn't. Um, I would say the important point is to know that you, you need to have your own opinion of how these different concepts fit together for yourself in where um, you're going to go in your future. You need to figure out your mental model and your framework of how things work. If it 
so happens to be that you borrow somebody else's idea because it's a really great idea, that's okay. Just give them credit. Here's another guy who talks more about the role of each in terms of who is working on each of the components. And so when you develop your own framework for these things, you could talk about the substance itself. You can talk about the role or the approach or technique used, right? There's a lot of pieces that you could work with. If you recall at the very beginning of the presentation, I talked about how it, creating web applications is not just plumbing work, it's also food service. And so now I want to uh, make an attempt at comparing the ideas in food service with the ideas in creating web applications. I want us to bring back this character, or I wanted to bring back this character of Mario, who is by profession a plumber, but is now faced with the challenge of being a chef. I found out through researching um, that there is a game called the Super Mario Odyssey, where Mario has to learn how to cook and complete some cooking challenges in order to save Princess Peach. I think this is very similar to where undergraduate students are as they're trying to figure out what it is they need to learn. And so I think this is a really good time to now transition to an expert in that domain, Mr. Gordon Ramsay. Um, and I want to point out that there are some similarities, right, to all the TV shows that Mr. Ramsey appears on and his advice on being meticulous, about being technically proficient, all of that, you know, definitely applies to application development. Um, it is a challenging world, it's exciting, there's a lot happening, but um, definitely you'll get challenged and you'll love it, you'll enjoy it. Um, okay, so now for the next few slides, you might see Mr. Ramsey appear again as I bring in his expertise with uh, food development. Now, when I was trying to come up with my own idea of how the various web technologies fit into each other, initially I started with a stack. I thought, okay, let's keep it simple. It works nicely to say these are all just a bunch of layers on top of each other. I was definitely inspired by the TCP IP model of different layers, one on top of each other. So I started thinking, is it is it like a stack of pancakes? Then I thought about it a little bit more and over time I realized, no, it's not, it's not quite right to me. I think that web development is more like a means to an end. Um, it's really good if you can, as a professional, develop your own professional opinion about things. And I just wanna share that my, my version of the professional opinion is that web development is a means to an end it is very much like serving a dim sum meal because now you've got little components and widgets that you're serving up to the end user, right? Because in web development, widgets are possible. You can use containers to deliver the widgets. You can use containers to, de to, to, to deliver, um, you know, a web server architecture as well. The end user may lack technical literacy, um, they may not know how any of it was made, but all they care about is, you know, what it looks and feels like. Also, the end user can access any combination of widgets. So I think that a dim sum meal is like a very good um, and really fitting analogy. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to agree with me. Like, I want to be careful and say, this is just my take on it. And so following along with my analogy, uh, then the browser, the web browser is like the diner's table. So I've got a Nintendo handheld device here to show, you know, a web page in a browser. And then you've got some input controls, to, you know, that, that can be used to browse, uh, to give data into that web browser interface. One of the main responsibilities of a restaurant happens to be consistently 
delivering high quality meals to their customers. Now, how do they do that? They have to be organized. The web is organized in a sense. You've got some official committee members making decisions that everyone should be adhering to. Here I've got on the slide on the left there in the middle, it says the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C for short. This is actually the official organization of like committee members who decide on each of the release versions for HTML, CSS, and so on. Um, they decide what are specific syntax to have, what are the new features that are allowed in each of the latest releases. And they also decide how each browser should handle uh, or like what is the minimum standard that every browser should be able to handle. They come up with specification documents. It's a really good thing to read up on and follow. You don't have to follow it closely every day, obviously, depending on you know your role, but it's good to know about and to periodically check in to see you know, what is the latest version of everything, what are the major changes since the last version, and so on. To maintain high quality service um, and consistent service, high quality kind of also means consistent, right? So you definitely um, are going to be like a restaurant where if you have something on the menu, you're going to have to time and time again deliver the same thing because that's what the end user is expecting. Uh, furthermore, to create a web page, here's a very basic structure. Um, at the core of a web page, it looks very much like a tree um, data structure, where at the root you have HTML, the tag HTML, which I've got um, on this left side here. That is the root of a single web page. So. If you have an index.html page or you have an about.html page, whatever it is, you have at the root, the, uh, sorry, at the root you have HTML. Then you have a child node that is the head tag and a sister or brother node called body. And that's it. You just got the two parts at level one. And then within each of those, you then have different set of nodes that are possible. And it's not a binary tree because you're not limited to just two nodes, but the first two, I guess, levels are looking like a binary tree. Um, you could have a third script thing. I don't think it's limited to either of these two, but for the most part, if you just ignore the JavaScript part, you would typically see HTML with two ch child nodes, two children nodes. Uh, typically you'll see HTML with two children nodes. Um, so within the head node, uh, or sorry, the children of the head node are the metadata elements. So you can have a title to describe uh, or to give information to the browser to display in a certain place, the title of the page, um, you know, what is the default zoom setting, uh, default device, uh, metadata for the web scraper to look through, and etc. You can also set the style rules in there. It's not required to be there, but it's generally good practice to put that there. Then you have the body tag. The body tag is where you have all the contents of your web page that you'd like to, to show up in your browser to go in that part. Um, so that's the core of where if you were to have web front end web um, front end web development work, that's where you would be creating the structure, sometimes creating style rules to be consistent with the structure. Now you might be wondering, how do I know what tags to use? Well, always consult the specifications if you're uncertain. Um, there are a lot of textbooks out there, so you know there's definitely a lot of resources to learn how HTML works. Uh, I wanted to show you an example here of mapping the structure, the tree structure, in the indented form with a, I guess, spatial layout on the right. 
So in the last slide, we looked at the structure itself and how the data is handled. This comes from a history of XML, which is basically an indentation type of language that signifies ch child nodes or children nodes, I should say, of the parent using indentation. Okay, so for each additional level here that's pictured, it is just an extra indentation. As you write out the HTML for a page and you have indentation, well, then it starts building up uh, boxes on the screen. So it's, it's like a typewriter. When you type a new line, it'll fill in that line. And then when you press enter to go to a new line, it'll start filling in the next line. So it's kind of working like, um, I guess, an array. Uh, you could further specify the rules, but here, if you don't specify, by default, you have this kind of uh, look. The head and title text stuff is not shown within the browser. The body tags do show up in the browser. So this, if this were a web page, it would show heading, H1 heading, because that's the text that shows up, and then you have paragraph one and then paragraph two. It does tend to grow from the top of the page downward. So as you define more elements, by default, it will be loading in the browser like that. Um, now, before I transition over to talk about presentation, I just want to take a quick moment to remind you, Gordon Ramsay also has advice on being meticulous in how you plate your food, right? So you want to be careful of how everything looks. Now, there's some principles at play. Um, you know, if you were to study user experience design, if you were to study graphic design, all of this, they have principles about how things should be lined up, um, how, how to make the layout look nice. There's just certain principles to know about. Um, the symbols that you see on the screen here, comes from a guide on plating techniques. It says um, there are certain lines on a plate, for instance, that look good. So you could have one line, you could have parallel lines, you could have um, a circle, etc. so on, right? Like you can probably imagine if you were to go to a fine dining restaurant, they may arrange their food a certain way. Another concept that is used for designing for the web is the grid layout. It comes from print design. So back in the day when they had printing presses or they were creating newspapers and magazines and so on, the people doing the printing and the formatting would think about where content is laid out on a page. One of the benefits of this is that if they were to sell ad space to advertisers, they can then say, you know, in a two by three inch um, section, you can have this many lines and words, and then it just makes it easier for the copy editor to fill in, you know, appropriately. It also helps a lot in the actual printing part because then you could standardize the size of different fonts, each character, how many characters per line, um, you know, all these other decisions become easier because you have a set of rules, so to speak, to ensure consistency. Before the grid layout days, uh, you know, back in the 90s, the, the people creating websites and designing websites were not exactly um, trained in art school. So the style there, you know, was, was really quite all over the place. Um, so Marvel had fun with this. Um, they created this website, I think more recently than the 90s. I think it was within the last few years. However, they were mimicking the aesthetic of the 90s. And so you could see, you know, there's all sorts of colors and just basically a lot of stuff going on.
if Gordon Ramsay were to see something like that, he wouldn't be too excited. So keep in mind, you should always adhere to um, good principles um, and just know what you're doing. I want to introduce this idea that there's a bunch of frameworks and libraries and other like plugins that you could use to quickly jumpstart a new web project. Some of these are great, some of these are not so great. Okay, it's kind of like telling Mr. Ramsey to use a Milkit service. He'll probably disagree with that approach because he's just so skilled in what he's doing that he doesn't want to use the product that somebody else designed. He probably knows that what he's able to come up with is gonna be much better quality. He probably knows that uh, the ingredients he's gonna choose is gonna be of the freshest quality. If you lack that expertise, then of course, yeah, you probably will have to make use of what's available out there, you know, but the downside there is you really got to know what they've created so you can be sure to use it correctly. So the moral of the lesson is it's better to learn the techniques rather than the products. So as we see on the right there, you can try to aim for something and not quite make it, right? You just got to know the principles, you've got to know the techniques, you've got to have the experience. All of that comes into play. All of that comes into helping you deliver consistent, high quality end results. And so here now I just got a few examples showing, um, you know, when you have to use what somebody else makes, when you're not quite sure what you're doing, how the results are a little less ideal. Knew anything about chicken sandwiches? I mean, obviously one is going to be tastier than the other. There's different levels of expertise uh, and depending on how uh, experienced you are, right? You're going to have different, a different, you'll, well, okay, for one thing, you'll develop an eye for what it should look like in the end, and then two, you'll be able to execute on that vision that you have. Going back to the idea of specifications, of adhering to what you should be doing, and for ensuring that when you're working with machines, that a machine knows what you're doing, or what you want it to do. Um, now we're going back to, you know, things that you should be doing. Certain certain techniques you should have. Uh, web pages should have a document type definition at the very top, the very first line. You could get away with not having it. A browser is going to be smart enough to kind of figure out what to do. But if you want complete and total control, then you probably should put it and then just say, you know, your configuration of whatever it is that you've, you want. Um, I think earlier browsers like before 1995 or maybe before 2000, they had to have this line, otherwise it wouldn't work. And it's very similar to this idea of if you write a shell script and you don't put the shell, a uh, shebang shell uh, location on there, it may or may not work. Why? Because it needs to know where shell is to be able to use shell to run that shell script. That's similar here. It's, it's a more raw, uh, basic way of how things are. Nowadays, if you want to throw up a quick website, you could probably get away with, without it. But if you want to have your search engine SEO optimization, uh, sorry, search engine optimization to be happening uh, in a positive way, way, then you probably do need to have the correct doc type. If you want a validator to give you all green check marks of all is good, then you also want to put that there as well. 
it defines the markup language and the syntax there. So, you know, like it could be HTML, XML or XHTML, etc. Um, you might be wondering like, well, once I define a language, how do I know how to program in it? You can read the specifications and you could read line by line every single thing out there, or you can maybe get to know this notation called the BNF notation. It represents the grammar of a computer language. So it's basically saying you could have like a menu of these options, such as if you had a sandwich that you're creating and you use a, a BNF notation to describe the menu options available, then you can say that mustard and mayonnaise is optional, lettuce and tomato is optional, but you definitely want any type of sauce to occur before lettuce and then before tomato. Similar with meat, you could have any or all in whatever order between two to four. You don't want too much. You don't want too less. Um, and then you could have cheese and then the top slice of bread. So that's basically, you know, the menu and the construction of a sandwich described in BNF form. And then we have the graphical figure just to like show you an example of expressing that graphically. There's a bunch of dev tools in a browser that could be really helpful in previewing changes or diagnosing problems with websites. So I just listed a few here in case you need to look it up. Um, you do have to be careful when you're working on the web. The stakes are high, right? It's, it's often that you end up creating stuff that gets a lot of eyes on it, which means you got to be careful because you want high quality, you want consistency, you want people to be excited when they're using the stuff you're using. And if it keeps breaking, well, that that's just not exciting, right? So you want to try and uh, prevent problems, but you also want to be able to quickly find where the problem is. So going back to the idea of different layers of the different protocol models, We've got the different layers, and that means the errors for web pages and websites can be at any layer. It could be a presentation related error. It could just be permissions. It could be that the file you're trying to access does not exist. It could be any of these, right? So again, getting at least a basic understanding of the network can help you be more effective as a web developer. Another thing to remember is that each browser may have a different default. And this is definitely true about like 10, 15 years ago when I was doing web development, each of the different operating systems and each of the different browsers would have a different default font. So when a graphic designer said, I really want the fonts to line up like this with this amount of pixel different or pixel distance from each other, <coughs> excuse me and this amount of proportion of the font itself, uh, well, you know, at that time it wasn't possible. And so I had to explain, look, my hands are tied where this is concerned because the browser won't be able to handle it. You should send me an image file and I'll display that instead of rendering the font with the browser itself. HTTP status codes is one way to find out what error is happening, especially when it's in one of the more like hardware related errors. Um, so we can have, and you probably seen pretty often like a 404 error that just means cannot be found or a page not found. You can have, for instance, a 405 method not allowed. Um, and then there's just different families of status code. So I, I put this here so you can see, you know, generally the different families. And then if you click through to any of these links, you'll see the full list. There's a bunch out there 
And if you know generally like which number it starts with, you can know the class of errors and you know that definitely helps with figuring out where to go when you're debugging. Um, oftentimes if you have an error message, it's great to have a, a nice pleasant message for the end user. Uh, you may or may not know when it's happening, but it's, you know, regardless, you should have a default nice message to the end user. Uh, you know, just, just to point out, you could also have a hardware issue. Uh, more things to be aware of if you're designing for the front end for the end user is that the end user may not have the same expectations. They may be coming with a different device with a different screen size, right? So if you were to develop for like, say a television interface or television or like presentation, conference room presentation screen with on like large screen, it's going to look a certain way. If you're designing for like a retina desktop monitor, it would be looking a different way. And then also like a laptop, tablet, phone, it's just all going to look different, right? So you could have potentially one web page, you know, say for instance, Brooklyn College, uh, their homepage, and then it just depends on which device they're loading from would then affect um, what the end result looks like. So that's just something to keep in mind. A lot of industry folks use responsive design with CSS to handle this. Uh, but you know, others will say we're just going to redirect uh, mobile users to the mobile site. And you'll see that with Wikipedia where they've got like the M to say uh, redirected to the mobile version. Uh, another thing to consider is for the different devices, the input types that the user can send to the machine is going to be of different, um, I guess, like gestures. So you can have a mouse and keyboard on a computer, desktop or laptop, but with mobile devices, you're probably going to have more of like screen taps and swipes and that sort of stuff. Um, always remember that when you're working in a team environment, because most, most likely web development will be a team environment. Others might inspect your code. So they might comment or sorry, they might want to see comments. They might want to see clean code, be cognizant of this. Uh, you also maybe will, if you're working in certain industries such as health or finance, you might be audited from time to time you know, having clean, well-documented code definitely helps along the way. Some of the best advice that I can give you to learn more is to build your own community of practice. That means to find your own support group, a professional, I guess, leading support group of that specific skill set you want to build, of that specific domain knowledge that you want to build. And I've, you know, show us, I put, I've found a few websites that I'm putting in a list here just to show you the variety that's out there. You've got magazines, you've got blogs, you've got organization blogs versus personal blogs. You've got different topics in each of the blogs. And there's just so much information out there. It's almost too much information. <clears throat> But the key is to use these as a way to network and expand your circle of knowledge. To Next recap, step, we're going that, to be looking uh, at some this, of the This video was a lecture on what is the web learn world to develop on the web. What are the uh, aims the and the challenges things that you should, in working in that space that you should be able to adapt in the next part into of your uh, this series? I was invited to talk also about what are these? Uh, what are some of the common scenarios when you're working on the front end of web development? And what are some techniques to, or best, I should say, techniques and or best practices to resolve those issues? Thank you for watching this video. Please take a moment to like.
this video and subscribe to the channel for notifications for more videos. Thank you so much.